content warning. The following episode includes discussion of homophobia, anti-LGBTQ bigotry, sexual assault, and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. During my time in undergrad at The Ohio State University, like most four-year colleges and universities in the U.S., we were required to take courses from other departments in the university outside our major. At OSU, these non-major courses were called GECs. In retrospect, I'm sure GECs made Ohio State a ton of money, probably still do, but they did serve a purpose, especially when starting out at the school GECs lead students to taking courses they might not necessarily take otherwise, exposing them to information and skills they might not obtain in their major, and assisting in the development of critical thinking skills. I was originally an international studies major, but later switched to double majoring in political science and sociology, in part because of GECs. But in any case, since I was in the honors program, I was able to take an Honors English course for one of my GECs freshman year. Honors English 110 was an intro writing course, a smaller course than the others I was taking that quarter, less than 20 students. So as part of our grade, we had to write a paper. The assignment was to visit a student organization we would never otherwise go to, something that was outside our comfort zone, observe the event, learn about the group, potentially ask them questions, and then write about it. Now, as a newly minted but thoroughly on board, sold out for right-wing Jesus evangelical, what group did I decide to visit? The GLBT Pride Group. This group met in the basement of the now demolished Old Ohio Union. I was allowed to observe the meeting as long as I pledged not to out the members of the group, which I agreed to and I honored their anonymity. There were maybe about a dozen people there sharing their experiences being gay or lesbian. While I was at the meeting, I was surprised to see a face that I recognized, someone from my dorm that I interacted with a fair bit, but I didn't know he was gay, and he hadn't come out at that point. Many in the group were in different stages of coming out, and struggled with the prospect of acceptance from friends, roommates, others on campus, and especially family back home. And keep in mind, this was 20 years ago, So while discrimination still exists against LGBTQ people today, there was even less acceptance then. Now, hindsight is 2020, but I do not recommend you do what I did for the sake of a course assignment. This was a place of refuge for LGBTQ students, a space where they could be with others who could identify with their experiences and feel a degree of safety. My presence as an interloper was surely not helpful in that regard, though members of the group were so much more accommodating and gracious than what I deserved. And I think that was one of the many moments over the next few years, kind of like pins on a timeline, that would lead me to my current views on LGBTQ acceptance and affirmation. That experience led to a train of thought in my head that can never be answered by my evangelical faith in a way that made sense. My campus ministry and my church at the time would always say that being gay was a choice, that homosexuality was a preference and behavior and a sin, and it couldn't be a sexual orientation you were born with. And your choices for acceptable sexuality were either heterosexual marriage or celibacy. But if being anything other than heterosexual is a choice, then why would people intentionally choose to make their lives more difficult, to risk not being accepted by family, friends, roommates, mentors, and to risk being ostracized by their houses of worship or the communities they're from, and risk potential job discrimination and housing discrimination, or even risk their lives? There is no way people would willingly risk all of that over a choice. That made absolutely no sense to me. This has to be inborn. I don't remember telling myself when I was a teenager that I needed to be attracted to guys. It just happened one day. And it would make sense that this is what happened to people who are gay and lesbian, but with the same sex, or people who are bisexual with both sexes. 
Something about what I was learning from my church community wasn't squaring up to reality. Now the question is, can you be a Christian and fully affirm LGBTQ people? Yes. Yes, you can. I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Pot Stirrer Podcast. The terms LGBTQ and queer generally encompass people who are of sexual orientations and gender identities other than heterosexual cisgender. This episode will primarily focus on sexual orientation. There's so much to unpack when it comes to Christianity and LGBTQ acceptance that it's going to need a couple of episodes at least to even scratch the surface. I will focus on gender identity particularly transgender and gender nonconformity, in an episode that will be out next month. Recently, the United Methodist Church, the second largest Christian denomination in the U.S., voted in favor of what they called the traditional plan, which means that they will not marry same-sex couples or allow LGBTQ people in leadership roles. This is highly controversial as many UMC congregations particularly in Western countries, are open and affirming, and some LGBTQ church members have taken on leadership roles. The decision may end up leading to a major church split. Some UMC congregations have already begun protesting the decision at their churches, and a few are already making plans to split from the main denomination. Time may tell what the long-term outcome will be for the UMC, But what is known is that many LGBTQ members and allies were deeply hurt by the decision and feel torn about being part of a denomination where their individual church has welcomed them, but their denomination has not. I tend to focus a lot on evangelicals in my episodes about religion, but this issue is bigger than evangelicalism. Non-affirming doctrine doctrine that treats non-heterosexual, non-cisgender sexual and gender expression as wrong tends to figure prominently in evangelical churches, of course, but it's also a fixture in mainline churches such as the UMC, as well as the Roman Catholic Church, and in African American Protestant churches. Statistically, Black Protestants tend to hold conservative views on homosexuality on par with white evangelicals. A huge reason why queer Black people in particular struggle a great deal with acceptance in their families and in the Black community is because of conservative teachings on homosexuality in many Black churches. This is especially a big deal because the church is a major institution within the Black community. Historically, civil rights leaders were trained up in the church, and even today, The Black church is influential in community leadership and in legitimizing politicians. Personally, I have encountered Black people who are socially progressive in most respects, balk at even considering the idea that homosexuality might not be a sin or that people could be born gay. And the idea that people being transgender is even more taboo, which is a shame, considering that According to the Trans People of Color Coalition and the Human Rights Campaign, Black trans women face the highest level of fatal violence out of all subcategories of LGBTQ people. And a lot of the cultural stigma when it comes to homosexuality and gender identity is woven in religion and the influence of the Black church. I always thought it was kind of an odd thing, considering the immense popularity in the Black community of a Hollywood movie franchise with the main character being a man dressed in drag. We can accept Tyler Perry playing Medea, but not our child who might be gender nonconformist? Really? Christianity's approach to people who are homosexual or bisexual and doctrine regarding sexual orientation matters. It matters for both queer people and the church. About the church, Much like the barring of women from church leadership, 
God-given talents are wasted, blessings are missed, and callings unfulfilled when people are restricted in ministry participation due to their sexual orientation. This man-made ceiling limits what God has gifted the church, and we all lose. Divides are created in the church over homosexuality when there isn't really any valid reason to do so. It damages Christian witness. It gives Christians a rationale to lack compassion and empathy for other people. And the gospel is presented as an anvil instead of a source of freedom. For gay people, the issue is twofold. Many U.S. Christian denominations and sects have led the charge against equal rights for lesbians and gay men. This includes fights against same-sex marriage or any government recognition of same-sex committed relationships by groups such as Focus on the Family and the American Family Association, as well as the Mormons and a number of evangelical denominations. Many of these same groups are involved in the opposition to government protection against housing and employment discrimination, as well as discrimination by businesses open to the public based on sexual orientation. But beyond these issues, for LGBTQ people, a huge source of pain and anguish is the lack of acceptance from family and religious institutions, and sometimes even active hostility if they've come out or if they've been outed. Teens being kicked out of their parents' homes, kids kicked out of schools, such as the school Second Lady Karen Pence teaches at, adults who are lesbian or gay have been institutional targets of discrimination at conservative Christian colleges and have been kicked out of ministry leadership, including at churches that are ambiguous about their policies regarding participation by LGBTQ people. In churches that take a conservative approach to homosexuality, gay Christians are often told that if they are not willing to marry someone of the opposite sex, they must not pursue romantic relationships at all they are expected to remain celibate. Matthew Vines, author of God and the Gay Christian, argues that compulsory celibacy for gay Christians is a twisting of scripture to mandate a condition that is meant to be a calling or gift, not a condition gay and lesbian Christians are forced into by the church. He also contends that this approach leads to negative outcomes for gay Christians. He says, quote, for gay Christians, the challenge of mandatory celibacy goes far beyond their mere capacity to live it out. Mandatory celibacy corrodes gay Christians' capability for relationship in general. But it does something else equally harmful. By requiring gay Christians to view all their sexual desires as temptations to sin, it causes many of them to devalue, if not loathe, their bodies. End quote. He later goes on to say, quote, The meaning of Christian celibacy as a gift in chosen calling is undermined when we insist that gay Christians remain celibate as a rejection of their sexuality. End quote. And sometimes families or church leaders will try to fix their gay loved ones or congregants by sending them to gay conversion therapy, also known as ex gay or reparative therapy. And there are times when, in desperation, gay Christians themselves choose to undergo it with the hope that they no longer will have to struggle with their sexual orientation in an institution that believes it to be wrong. Gay conversion therapy has been known by the mental health community for years to be harmful to those who have undergone it. Back in 1998, the American Psychiatric Association had this to say about conversion therapy. Quote, the potential risks of reparative therapy are great, including depression, anxiety, and self-destructive behavior, since therapist alignment with societal prejudices against homosexuality may reinforce self-hatred already experienced by the patient. Many patients who have undergone reparative therapy relate that they were inaccurately told that homosexuals are lonely, unhappy individuals who never achieve acceptance or satisfaction. The possibility that the person might achieve happiness in satisfying interpersonal relationships as a gay man or lesbian is not presented, 
nor are alternative approaches to dealing with the effects of societal stigmatization discussed, end quote. According to a study released by UCLA, nearly 700,000 adults in the U.S. have received gay conversion therapy, including half who received it as adolescents. It is also estimated that 20,000 teens aged 13 to 17 will receive conversion therapy from a licensed health professional in states that have not banned it. And 57,000 teens across all states will receive conversion therapy from religious or spiritual advisors before they turn 18. And the outcomes for conversion therapy are, at best, ineffective and, at worst, damaging and dangerous. According to a 2002 study by Professional Psychology, participants report negative outcomes from conversion therapy, such as lower self-esteem, internalized homophobia, loneliness and social isolation, worsened relationship with their families, depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts. According to a study done by the Journal of Homosexuality, people whose parents had tried to change their sexual orientation were three times more likely to attempt suicide, and those whose parents sent them to conversion therapy were five times more likely to attempt suicide. The approach many churches have taken, that homosexuality is a flaw or sin that should be fixed or suppressed, is literally killing people. In this episode and future episodes regarding LGBTQ people, I will use the term affirming to refer to people who accept LGBTQ people without expecting them to change, and don't believe these different types of sexual orientations and gender identities are wrong or sin. I will use the term non-affirming to refer to people who do not fully accept LGBTQ people. This can range from belief that homosexual behavior is a sin or that gender is fixed by sex chromosomes and immutable to full-on homophobia or anti-gay bigotry. Now, a case can be made that all of it falls under homophobia or anti-gay bigotry. And I don't really disagree with that. Like white supremacy, homophobia and bigotry based on sexual orientation and gender identity has been something the church has trafficked in. And I think these things are related because these forms of bigotry are linked to authoritarianism and reinforcement of patriarchy. The role of the church in the oppression of queer people along with racial minorities and other groups, based on its hunger for control and patriarchal domination, needs to be named and called out 100%. That said, the goal in this episode isn't so much to call out as much as it is to provide a different and, I think, freeing perspective. This is more about us than about the institutions, leaders, or principalities selling hate to us. Affirming and non-affirming are also terms that are commonly used by LGBTQ Christians to describe churches and individuals and are used by watchdog groups like Church Clarity, who seek to encourage transparency in church stances on sexual orientation and gender identity. So I'm going to defer to that terminology. This episode is really for the people who might be open to thinking more deeply about what the Bible says about these issues, and exploring if a person can be a Bible-believing Christian and affirming. And that ties into if someone can be a Bible-believing Christian and gay. Through decades of the culture wars, most of us have heard that the Bible is clearly anti-gay, so that's why many Christians are anti-gay. Maybe you're a Christian yourself, or have been a Christian at one point, and wonder this too. This episode might also be helpful for people who are in the church and gay, lesbian, or bisexual and struggle with the lack of affirmation in their church community. Since I'm not part of the queer community, I will state here that I'm on the outside looking in, and in that I may fall short here, but I will do my best. I want to be able to do what I can to support people who need to know embracing who you truly are doesn't have to be at odds with Christianity. 
it may be at odds with toxic Christianity, and needing to walk away from the faith to heal yourself is a valid choice. It isn't the only choice, though, and some queer Christians who don't want to let go of their faith completely may find some comfort here. And this episode is also for those of us who are like myself. You may or may not be LGBTQ, you may or may not be Christian or even religious, but you have family or friends who are Christian and non-affirming. At the same time, you also might have family or friends who are LGBTQ, and you want to be the best support. You want to be an ally in support of your LGBTQ family and friends as you interact with those in your circle who are non-affirming. And you want to arm yourself with information that might help the non-affirming people you care about think more critically about their deeply held beliefs and eventually be open to changing their views on people who are queer. But you might be asking why Christians need God to tell them they should accept queer people. Shouldn't they be able to do that on their own? Of course. But here's my thought on this. From being a Christian, growing up in and out of the black church, and the experience of having been an evangelical as a young adult, and also because there are people dear to me personally who are both Christian and non-affirming. There are nuances, but I think non-affirming Christians generally fall into two categories. There are ones that are homophobic or bigoted to the core. They don't like people who are queer or the idea that sexual orientation or gender identity outside of what they personally experience and what they believe could be normal. They see people who are LGBTQ as threats to themselves, their children, their families, society, or prized institutions like marriage or their faith. And they may use church teachings and Bible verses to justify how they already feel. For them, Religion is merely a tool to hide behind bigotry. Religion is secondary. Then there are non-affirming Christians who don't have a particular issue with gay people or homosexuality or bisexuality. They may even enjoy the company of queer people or just don't think about the issue all that much in their day-to-day lives. A few of them might be privately questioning their own sexuality or gender identity but they truly believe that their faith is telling them it's wrong to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or gender nonconformist. Their pastors say so. Their mentors say so. Their Christian peers say so. And they believe the Bible says so. And especially if their faith is also telling them, as many forms of Christian expression do, that faith is more important than their family, friends, even their own life, remember John Chow, their minds, hearts, and emotions are not to be trusted, then they will take on that belief. Of course, people can change and disavow their bigotry over time, but this episode is more for that latter group than the former. I truly believe the non-affirming church, which is much of the church, unfortunately, needs to approach this differently. Because Even if you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, anti-LGBTQ bias is primarily based on cultural lenses. It's more about how we're reading the Bible and less about what the Bible actually states. Many non-affirming Christians lean on what are called the clobber verses to support their stance, particularly in regards to sexual orientation. There are six sections of the Bible, three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament, that are said to address homosexuality, primarily male homosexuality, as sin. These passages are called clobber verses because they are often used to emotionally clobber or really target lesbian, gay, and bisexual people for discrimination and abuse. And even though I did give a content warning at the beginning of this episode, I want to reiterate that here because the following discussion of these passages will include a reading of these clobber verses. These are from the New International Version or NIV. So let's dive into it. 
So God created mankind in his own image. The image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1.27 The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Genesis 2, 18-24 this is essentially the genesis of the saying, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, no pun intended. Argument being that because according to the creation stories, and yes, the Bible creation story is actually two stories back to back. According to these stories, God created one man and one woman. And the creation of the man and the woman who are able to then procreate means this is the only perfect design. But there are other ways of looking at the creation story that we should consider. Matthew Vines points out that despite the importance of procreation mentioned in the Genesis account, as well as the significance of procreation in the Old Testament, the creation story, particularly the story of Adam and Eve, focuses more on Adam's need for human companionship than on the need for Adam to carry his genes to the next generation. In Eve, Adam has another being to partner with him, who is like himself. The idea of sameness is the emphasis here in the story of Adam and Eve, rather than what makes them different. The animals were brought to Adam and he named them, but none were compatible with him. Eve was compatible with Adam as a suitable companion because she was like him, not because she was different. And Ralph Blair author and founder of the Gay Christian Network, Evangelicals Concerned, points out that in the New Testament, Galatians 3.28 states, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Given that the idea is that Jesus' purpose was to restore humanity back to God, to the relationship between humans and God, that existed during creation and prior to the fall of humanity due to sin, male and female were never meant to be points of difference to begin with, just forms of sameness. The presence of a man and a woman in these origin stories does not speak to the absence of a same-sex relationship, and that absence does not mean prohibition. It's reading much more into the text than what it was ever meant to address. Another passage commonly used to justify anti-gay doctrine is the Old Testament story of Sodom and Gomorrah, two ancient towns that were smited by God. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, Please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered. We will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, 
so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and he shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you'd like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge? We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. Genesis 19, 1-12 Sodom, along with neighboring Gomorrah, were destroyed by God according to the story. And many non-affirming Christians point to this story as an example where a town was wiped out for rampant homosexuality. Some even point to the term sodomy, which was a word that first appeared in the historical record in the 11th century, derived from Sodom. And some believe that if homosexuality is accepted here in the United States, we will go the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. A piece of context to understand is that in the ancient Middle East, hospitality was an extremely important value. The Middle East was, and still is, a region with incredibly harsh conditions in the presence of nomadic people groups. This was also before fast modes of transportation like cars or buses existed, and before inns or public lodging were common. So people traveling long distances during this time period often relied on the hospitality of strangers to survive their journeys. Hospitality was considered a nearly universal expectation, and the lack of hospitality was extremely frowned upon. This incident was an illustration of the wickedness of this locale. In this passage, when the group of men came to Lot's house to take the visitors to have sex with them, this wasn't consensual. This would have been gang rape. And rape is about power and control, not sex. Sexually assaulting visitors would definitely not be hospitable. Rape of men in particular was intentionally meant to be emasculating in a world that prized the masculine and saw the feminine as inferior. Lot offering his virgin daughters to the men to be raped in the visitor's place is extremely horrifying when we read about it today. It is one of the many problematic and troubling parts of the Bible. Now, in that culture, unmarried women were considered the property of their fathers to fetch a dowry or payment if they were to be married to a worthy suitor. Loss of virginity would have meant loss of value. So Lot offering up his daughters meant he was willing to take a financial hit in order to protect the well-being of strangers under his roof. And to really gain more context for why these towns were destroyed, Here's what the Bible says more specifically. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. Ezekiel 16, 49-50 So it wasn't homosexuality that did them in. It was their greed and lack of compassion for those in need. Even the early Christians understood the lesson from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. According to Matthew Vines, the interpretation of the passage to mean condemnation of homosexuality didn't really come about until around the 4th and 5th centuries, near the beginning of the Middle Ages, with religious philosophers such as John Cassian, Basil, St. John Chrysostom, Paulus Orosius, and St. Augustine of Hippo. The rest of these verses I'm going to talk about together because they're pretty similar. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Leviticus 18.22 If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, 
Both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Leviticus 20, 13. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, 9-10 Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Romans 1, 26-27 So to understand the context behind these passages, let's briefly discuss the ancient Mediterranean world. According to the work of Catholic scholar Daniel A. Helminiak, the way sexuality and gender were understood in the ancient Mediterranean world was much different than the way we see it today. The word homosexuality was not a word back during the time period the Bible was written. It came into existence centuries later. During this time period, sex was seen as generally more a matter of appetite than of sexual orientation. In some cultures, such as the ancient Greeks and Romans, Adult men often engaged in relations with teen boys or young men while still marrying women and building families. The structure of these societies was patriarchal, but not in terms of anatomical sex differences making a difference, but in terms of what was considered the gender role assumed during sex. The active participant was considered masculine, while the receptive participant, for lack of a better way to put it, was considered feminine. Some of these same-sex arrangements would be considered pederasty or child molestation today, but were an accepted rite of passage for males in these cultures. Also, according to Ralph Blair, the worship of Greek deities such as Aphrodite, Dionysus, and others, as well as their Roman equivalents, involved orgies. And these orgies included sexual acts with multiple partners, including those of the same sex. The ancient Jewish people prided themselves on being the chosen people, set apart by devotion solely to their deity, Yahweh. The prohibitions in Leviticus against men having sex with men are related to religious purity, staying away from the symbols and practices common among the groups surrounding them. The practice of men having sex with men, or young boys, was seen as something that was a hallmark of Greek and Roman culture, not that of the Jews, though it didn't mean it didn't happen, which I'll get into in a moment. But in any case, this was thought to be along the same lines as other non-Jewish practices, such as eating pork or shellfish, or wearing garments made of mixed fabrics. The passages in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy kind of follow this, for context, these books of the Bible are part of what are called Paul's epistles. Paul, who was also known as Saul of Tarsus, was a Jewish Pharisee who converted to Christianity after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and became one of the apostles. He is significant in early Christianity because he was a key bridge builder between Jewish converts and Gentile or non-Jewish converts. Expanding the reach of Christianity beyond the Jewish community, and he provided a lot of the early foundation of Christian doctrine. The Pauline epistles are letters from the Apostle Paul to early church plants around the ancient Mediterranean, and these epistles make up most of the New Testament outside of the Gospels. In 1 Corinthians, 
and 1 Timothy, the terms sexually immoral and those practicing homosexuality or men who have sex with men are two phrases that biblical scholars contend may be the result of misinterpretation during translation over time and not faithful to the original text. More probable translations include self-indulgent and weak for sexually immoral and men who exploit others either sexually or economically for homosexuality. So this may point more towards condemning passivity and exploitation than a preoccupation with sex practices. Vines points out that even in English language Bibles, the translation of these words changed significantly over several centuries. For example, in 1525, the Tyndale New Testament translated these terms as weaklings and abusers of themselves with the mankind, which over 400 years later became sexually immoral and practicing homosexuals. So the Bible itself changed with the times in a way that may not be faithful to the original text. In addition, the likely purpose of these passages from Paul's perspective was to take the stereotypes the Jewish converts often had of Gentiles, particularly that they were religiously impure, and explain that they were no better than the Gentiles. Without Christ's sacrificial death on a cross, all were doomed regardless of if they started out Jewish or pagan. And as for the passage in Romans, Paul is likely referring to the Greek orgies. These were very popular during this time period, and as Paul was traveling around the region, he would have come across these quite a bit. This is why out of the clobber verses, this is the only one that mentions women having sex with women. The others exclusively focus on men having sex with men. The focus in this passage in Romans is idolatry. These practices were seen not as a sexual orientation as we think of today, but as a part of a ritual in worship of gods outside of Yahweh. Now, some non-affirming Christians argue that even if the way the church has interpreted the clobber verses has been inaccurate, we need to look at the larger narrative of scripture. Vines frames this argument this way, quote, the Bible's references to same-sex behavior should be understood in light of the positive heterosexual vision we see throughout scripture, end quote. So for these non-affirming Christians, it stands to reason homosexuality must be immoral. But Helminiac points out that this argument does fall into the trap of logical fallacy, appeal to ignorance, or ad ignorantium. In other words, a conclusion can be drawn by an absence of information or framing a lack of information in one area with an abundance of information in another. This is a fallacy. You can't do that. Homosexuality is not the opposite of or the inverse of heterosexuality. Culturally, we need to consider that the ancient world placed a great deal of emphasis on procreation because strength in numbers was extremely important. You needed the extra hands to help tend to your animals, work on your crops, and help with the family business. You needed the extra hands to take care of you when you got old. Offspring in ancient societies meant everything. But we don't live in such a world now, especially in industrial and post-industrialized societies. In most of these societies, infant mortality is low. So most families in this part of the world don't need to keep having kids in order to have a few of them live past childhood. And even then, many couples, including heterosexual couples, choose to be child-free. And people are able to do that because we live in a society where you don't need a bunch of children to take care of you when you're older. While the Bible has a lot of positive insights and can teach us a great deal, we cannot simply divorce it from the cultural context it was written in. But besides that, is this positive heterosexual vision throughout scripture even true? I'm not so sure about that. Heterosexual relationships in the Bible are not always portrayed positively. There really isn't an ideal vision in the Bible, 
The Bible includes polygamy, men sleeping with their wives' servants, a king who had a woman's husband killed on the front lines in battle in order to take her as his own wife, a couple who was smited after lying about their offering to the early church. And remember Lot from the Sodom and Gomorrah story? Well, Lot's daughters were later impregnated by him after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because they mistakenly thought they were the last people left on earth. Even Adam and Eve weren't perfect. Their later actions in the origin story led to original sin in the fall of mankind. According to the Bible, Adam and Eve was the reason that we needed Jesus' sacrifice to begin with. And while homosexual relationships were not explicit in the Bible, some biblical scholars believe that friendships portrayed in the Bible, such as David and Jonathan and Ruth and Naomi, were in fact intimate same-sex relationships. One of the miracles of Jesus included the healing of a centurion servant, which is recounted in Matthew 8, 5-13 and Luke 7, 1-10 who, based on the original text, may have also been his intimate partner. In this, Jesus healed the servant because of the centurion's faith. He doesn't lecture him about his relationship with his servant or say his servant doesn't deserve healing because of their relationship. He simply heals the servant. The purpose of this episode is to present a different point of view, one where it's very possible to be a Bible-believing Christian and affirming of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people and relationships. When we examine the Bible, it's important to remember that it was written in a certain time period in a specific culture with realities and concepts that are foreign to us today. It's also important to remember that the Bible itself has gone through changes over time, many translations, and you do lose things in translation, but It's gone through many changes over time based on many factors, not all of which are purely religious. Some are political or social. At the end of the day, the question for Christians should be, does non-affirming doctrine produce good fruit or bad fruit? Placing undue burdens on people due to their sexual orientation, tormenting people and contributing to depression and suicide, dividing families, tearing apart familial relationships, friendships, and community bonds all over doctrine, doctrine that is on very shaky biblical ground at best. People hold on to what they consider to be tradition because it's what we know. But some traditions yield bad fruit and are worth letting go because people matter so much more. When we explore stories of the past, such as the creation stories of Adam and Eve or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, there is often more to the story than what we see at first glance. Modern history is pretty similar. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail over Easter weekend in 1963 while being held by police for protesting racial segregation in Birmingham, Alabama. But did you know? there was a group of white moderate ministers from Birmingham who inspired Dr. King to write the letter. The fascinating story of Dr. King in the Birmingham 8 is the subject of this month's Patreon bonus episode of Potstirer Podcast, which is available for download if you subscribe to the Flying Machine Patreon at the $5 pilot level. But the really cool thing is that you get bonus episodes from all the awesome podcasts from Flying Machine, plus the miniseries MC University, and so much more. But even if you give at the $1 mechanic level, you'll get our newspaper, a shout out on the Flying Machine podcast of your choice, and more. The Flying Machine Patreon helps support us in providing top-notch quality content. So go to patreon.com slash flying machine today and be a patron. Thanks so much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. Go to potstirrerpodcast.com slash download and links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get 
New episodes once they drop so you don't have to wait. Be sure to tell your friends about the show and tweet me with any suggestions at PotstirrerCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible flying machine.